Hello everyone, this is Randy here, and today I have uh, a video for you, a video essay on what I learned through watching StarCraft II. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, a lot of people ask why, why even bother watching uh, computer games. Uh, maybe it's a complete waste of time, uh, perhaps. Uh, or, or maybe you can learn something. <laughs> so, so for all of you asking, uh, well, what, what, what do you learn from watching other people play computer games? <laughs> uh, I've been doing it for, for more than a decade. What do you learn from all of that? Well, well this is the video for you. Or, or perhaps for your parents, if, if they're asking you, what do you learn from either playing or, or watching computer games? Specifically, I'm going to talk about uh, StarCraft II, uh, which is uh, a game that I've been watching for, uh, again, more than a decade. Uh, and, and I'm going to split the video up into, into several sections. So, so the first section, this is, this is the big roadmap, okay, <laughs> for, for this video. Uh, for the first section, I'm going to talk about what is StarCraft II, right? I'm going to give you an introduction because not all of you watching this video may know what that is. So, so I'm going to give you an introduction as to what 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 this is, this this game. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, in the next section of the video what what StarCraft II means for me and, and how uh, how I've interacted with with this game. And then in the third section uh, of, of this video, I'm going to explain a bit, uh, I'm gonna give you some background as to who I am uh, and, and my professional background and, and why that's actually uh, important uh, in, in this analysis. And then I'm going to talk about four different things that I've, I've learned from watching StarCraft II over, over the years. The first, is pursuing decisive victory. The second is the importance of pacing. The third is the value of counterattacks. And then the fourth is the power of surprise. So these are the four things that, that I've learned. I'm going to go through these four things later on in the video. I'm going to support my arguments using uh, examples from military history and from sports uh, and also examples from my own personal and professional life as a lawyer and litigator. So that's, that's the roadmap. That's what we're going to talk about today. I anticipate this video will be probably more than an hour. Uh, it's, it's, these are my thoughts. You can think of this as, as a video essay or a personal video essay. And here we go. So, so let's start with uh, what is StarCraft II? Okay, so StarCraft II is uh, a military science fiction game developed by Blizzard. It's a sequel to a very popular game called StarCraft and it's played by thousands, if not uh, millions of people uh, in, in the world. It's very popular in uh, South Korea, uh, for example, where, where there's a lot of competitive play uh, for this game. It's considered an RTS, which stands for Real-Time Strategy Game. So it's, uh, I don't know what, how, how I can verbally explain an RTS, but, but, but it's, it's, uh, it's a game where you you build units and military units. Uh, you have uh, resources that you have to mine and collect, and basically you fight. Uh, it's it's a game where you build an army and the other side has an army, and you you fight. It's a game of military uh, conquest, if you will, involving rival armies that uh, that clash. And it's a zero-sum game in that there, there's a winner and there's a loser uh, that, that you are trying to uh, eliminate uh, the opposing army uh, and trying to eliminate uh, their forces. And if you are successful in doing so, uh, you win 
uh, the game. Uh, now, this game can be played casually, uh, or it can be played uh, competitively, in, in the sense that you can have people who are actually competing for uh, money uh, on, on a very grand stage with uh, you know thousands, if not you know millions of people watching uh, these games, either uh, at, at uh, studios uh, at where, where they're actually playing the games or, or online. So, so it's actually highly popular. It's considered uh, an e-sport or electronic sport uh, where, where there's a, a big fan following uh, for this game, especially in countries like, like South Korea. Uh, to, to a certain extent, uh, it's very popular in Europe uh, and, and a lesser extent in North America. Uh, but, but I think it, it's maintained its popularity in, in North America as well. Uh, central to the game, there are uh, three different races. Uh, there is a, a human race called the Terrans, a space bug race called the Zerg, um, and sort of an advanced alien race called the Protoss. That's not really necessary for, for you to remember for the purposes of, of this video. Uh, some of the best players uh, in the game right now, they, they usually have very shortened names um, because they're screen names for, for, these, uh, for these players. Uh, these uh, uh, Esports athletes, uh, if you will, who, who play this game competitively. Um, there's a, a very strong player from Finland named Sero. Uh, there's a, a very strong player who uh, recently beat Sero, actually. Um, uh, he's from France. He's named Clem. And he's a young uh, man in his 20s. Uh, there are a number of very strong players from South Korea, uh, Maru, uh, Dark. Uh, yeah, and the list goes on. And these are some of the players who, who are currently playing as of today, which is August 2024. Uh, and obviously, throughout the history of StarCraft II, there's been other players who've done very well. And I'm sure in the future, there will be new names, uh, people who, who do very well uh, in, in this game. So, so that's a, a bit of background as to as to what is StarCraft II. It, it's, uh, in essence, uh, a military science fiction computer game that has um, a strategic element where you build an army that fights another army um, and it can be played competitively in that it can be played uh, where, where there's lots of people watching at a very high level for, for large amounts of money. For example, the most recent StarCraft II tournament with a million dollars. And the first place uh, player who was Clem, who beat Cero, he took home 400,000. Cero took home 150,000. So, so a million dollar tournament. So th these, are, these are fairly large tournaments. We're not talking about a couple hundred dollars here and there. Th these are you know, big, big tournaments. Uh, and and for for larger amounts of money, so so there is certainly a fan following uh, for for this game. Uh, now, what does StarCraft II mean for me? This is what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, now, first of all, I, I have to tell you that I don't actually play StarCraft II, so so I've never actually installed the game on my computer. Uh, I I just never have. That's, that may surprise some of you because I'm doing an entire video about a game that I have actually never played. But that being said, I have been watching this game for more than a decade and watching competitive episodes uh, of this game. Many of these uh, rounds uh, where people play, they go for, for you know an hour or maybe an hour and a half. The individual rounds may be somewhere between a couple minutes to, to half an hour to 45 minutes um, and you string a couple of these games together to, to create a, a, a series um, and, and then you're looking at maybe an hour and a half. So, so I've been watching this game, oh my god, for, for definitely more than a decade and quite religiously as well. It's not uncommon for me to be watching StarCraft II as my no source of as my source of entertainment on a, on a nightly basis for you know an hour uh, you know three times a week an hour here an hour there I could be spending somewhere between uh, five to ten hours uh, on a weekly basis on some weeks watching competitive StarCraft II play uh, which is pretty crazy it's 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 a game that I don't play but that I've spent countless. <laughs> countless hours watching. So, so I often get asked the question, like, why, why do you watch this, right? What, 
beyond the entertainment value, what, what, what do you learn from, from watching other people play computer games um, and, and spending more than a decade religiously watching other people play computer games uh, for hours and hours and hours? We're, we're talking about a, a significant number of hours here. I'm not talking about just as a, uh, as a casual hobbyist. I'm talking about someone who, who's spent a, a lot of time <laughs> watching uh, StarCraft II played at a competitive level. So that's more about um, how I've interacted with, with StarCraft II. And, and then the, I'll give you a little bit of background as to who I am uh, and, and why this becomes important in the analysis later on. Well, once we get to the meat of, of this video as to what exactly I, I've learned from, from watching StarCraft II, the life lessons that, that I've garnered that, that maybe you, you have also uh, you know, garnered from from watching StarCraft II if you if you do watch it, or or from computer games in general. So a bit bit more about myself. So I, I am a lawyer, uh, but specifically I am a litigator, which means that I go to court, uh, I represent clients, and I I am often in in a dispute uh, oriented uh, profession, right? So I, I'm representing a client, and we're having essentially a fight. Um, an adversarial fight, which is again often a zero-sum game, very similar to StarCraft, actually, and it's very similar to a lot of other types of games and, and athletics, which which I will describe later on in this video. So, so I have a lot of experience fighting with people, <laughs> not not physically fighting, but verbally fighting with people. I have a lot of experience fighting with people through through lawsuits uh, in court. So so I fight, but but I fight as as a lawyer. Um, and I do it at the highest level. I do competitive <laughs> debating, if you will, but at the highest level, which is law, which is going to court. Uh, the highest level of competitive debating is, is court litigation, <laughs> where you're arguing for, for the rights of, of your clients, uh, where it is um, an adversarial process. It's a zero-sum game where you have a winner and a loser. The, the judge makes a decision. One person wins, one person loses. Um, and and where, where where the winner could take home millions of dollars and the loser doesn't get anything, so it, it is uh, there. There are many parallels between what I do professionally uh, and and StarCraft and, and these types of you know real time strategy games similar to StarCraft. Uh, and there are many strategies that that I I'm going to draw parallels to today in this video. So, so, so I hope that's clarified sort of what StarCraft II is as a computer game, how I've interacted with this particular video game, uh, this, or computer game as, as, uh, as I may call it, uh, over the course of you know, more than a decade, uh, probably 15 years, at least 15 years of, of watching StarCraft II, and a little bit about me as to how my background uh, influences this analysis today. So again, the four things I'm going to talk about um, in terms of what I've learned, in terms of the life skills, um, and in terms of just philosophically what I've learned from watching StarCraft II. Uh, number one, pursuing decisive victory. Number two, which is the, uh, the value of pacing. Number three, the importance of counterattacks. Number four, the power of surprise. So, so let's start with number one, pursuing decisive victory. There, there can be all types of, uh, of victories uh, in the world, some uh, being more decisive than others and some being easier than others and, and some occurring much earlier on in the process than others. Uh, what StarCraft II has taught me is that in some types of games, and, and I consider many things that we do in life as games as well. Litigation, what I do, is, is a game, right? Sports, competitive sports, is a game. Um, disputes between people, that's, that's a game. A fight between people, it's a game. These are, these are real games, right? They're, they're, some, some of these games are life or death games. Um, they're, they're very, very serious, but, but I consider for the purposes of, of, of my analysis today, these are games. These are just games that we play as humans. They may be very serious and people's rights are on the line or their life or their security or their money is on the line. But nevertheless, these are games. 
And StarCraft II is, is a, a nice way of taking something that is uh, simulated, right? Where, where the stakes are relatively low, um, you know, relatively speaking, right? It's a computer game between people. Um, and taking lessons from that and trying to draw that out and trying to apply that uh, to, to other types of games in life that may actually be more serious uh, and, and more significant in terms of the, the consequences and, and the gravity of, uh, of these types of games. So decisive victory. Uh, what, what do I mean by decisive victory? It's a victory that is uh, early, it's decisive, and, and it prevents your opponent from really elongating and prolonging the game. It, it just ends the game early. It, it's, it's you stamp out the opposition as early as possible before they are able to form their full might, before they are able to, to really grow to, to oppose you any further. Uh, and in StarCraft 2, this is often the case because some, uh, some rounds in, in StarCraft 2 can last just a couple minutes where one opponent uh, easily uh, just destroys the other opponent where the game lasts maybe you know two or three minutes where the game could in theory last for half an hour or 45 minutes where where the the army gets larger on both sides and, and there's a, a gigantic battle in the center of uh, of the map um, but but it doesn't have to last for 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour it could end in the first two or three minutes of the game and and that's also a point right for for the player that wins that's also a point doesn't matter if you take half an hour 45 minutes an hour to win or two minutes to win you still get a point uh, and you still it still counts as defeating your opponent and and you see this type of scenario in in in, in some sports for example not not all types of sports uh, but but in some sports you, you see this so so you, you see this in, for example, boxing, uh, mixed martial arts, where, where you have these first round knockouts, right? Where the opponent is, is eliminated immediately and there is no need for you then to actually engage in further fighting, for you to have to spend more time uh, and resources into fighting the opponent, right? A first round knockout is, for example, someone like Mike Tyson who knocks out an opponent in the first round, right? Doesn't, doesn't need to fight anymore. That's, that's the game. The, the process is over. And that's what I would consider a decisive victory. The opponent has not had their ability to, to elongate the fight, um, to execute their strategy. They've been defeated. So, so there is actually a military doctrine that goes all the way back to Sang Su, right? Sang Su, who wrote The Art of War, a very famous book, um, treatise on military strategy. And Sang Su says that not all victories are the same. Um, the, the best type of victory is to defeat your opponent without actually having to fight your opponent. Right, he talks about this type of victory being being the best, defeating your opponent without actually having to fight your opponent. Um, if if you can ha somehow have your opponent surrender, that is the best form of victory. Not firing a single bullet, not shooting a single arrow, not unsheathing a single sword, just having your opponent um, be defeated to remove their resistance, have them surrender by way of just greater military strategy, pressure, coercion, uh, psychological fear. Uh, that, that, is, that is the best way for, for there not to be a fight at all. And, and then the next best in terms of victory is to prevent the opponent from joining forces, right? Uh, to prevent your opponent from mobilizing um, and joining forces in time so that you can isolate their units um, and, and, and destroy their, their units uh, in isolation. The next 
in, in the hierarchy, this is not not as good as as preventing your opponents from mobilizing, uh, is meeting them in the field. Right. This is a, a head-to-head battle, uh, a protracted battle, head-to-head. So that's that's not as good because now both sides are spending time, um, resources, money, energy uh, to to battle and and to win. So th- that type of victory comes at at a high cost. And then the the least favorable is besieging walled cities. So Song Su says that besieging a walled city is, is an extraordinary uh, expense. Um, and it's something that he uh, definitely disproves of uh, because it's very expensive, a lot of energy spent. So if you think of Sun Tzu's military hierarchy here in terms of the, the value of victory, and you look at uh, examples in sport uh, and examples in StarCraft, you, you begin to see a pattern where, where achieving decisive victory, uh, a quick and decisive victory before the other side can mobilize, before the other side can truly uh, pursue their own strategy, uh, and and you know to destroy the enemy in its infancy is is actually the highest level of victory that that can be achieved. Now, how does this apply to to daily life? Right, we're talking about military strategy and boxing. I mean, you may not be a boxer, and you may not be leading an army. Uh, I, I can apply this to to disputes as well as as a lawyer. So, so I'll give you uh, two examples. Uh, one is, uh, at, at one point I sent out a demand letter. So this is a, a legal letter that you sent out prior to actually starting litigation. So prior to actually starting a lawsuit, you send out this legal letter um, to, to the opposition, right? To, in, in this case, it was an employer. I was representing the employee in a, in a workplace dispute. So I sent out this letter and I, I made all of these demands. Uh, for the employee, and, and I guess this letter was was so well written <laughs> that in response to my legal letter, and again prior to going to court, prior to litigation, prior to actually serving a lawsuit, the other side came back and said, "We agree with everything. We <laughs> agree <laughs> with everything. Here's everything that you asked for." Um, and without fighting, without the need to go to court, without the need to actually litigate, without the need to go through a two-year dispute to go before a judge, they just basically gave all of the money that we asked for, right? So that's what I call a decisive victory. It's, it's a victory without the need to actually fight. The other side capitulated, they gave up. <laughs> so so that's the type of victory you, you want to aim for if you're, for example, a lawyer representing a plaintiff uh, going after a defendant. Now, conversely, if you are the defendant, right? If you're a company uh, and and you're threatened by, say, one of your ex-employees or by by somebody, an ex-customer or someone, and they're saying, "I want to sue you," I've had the opposite example where where I've represented the company as the defendant, and I've written such a good legal letter in response to their th- you know, overture or in response to their uh, their their threats to sue. That where, where I've dissected their case, uh, I've identified where their weaknesses are, the factual inconsistencies, and, and I've dismantled their credibility. But by virtue of either a phone call with their lawyer or, or a very poignant response to, to their initial legal letter, that they've agreed actually just not to start the lawsuit. Right? And that's happened too. Where instead of going through two years of, of a courtroom case, uh, two years of protracted litigation uh, inside uh, a courtroom by sending a letter by way of a, a simple half an hour phone call, I've convinced the other side not to start a lawsuit. And that's a decisive victory. From a defense standpoint, that's essentially having your city not be besieged at all, right? The enemy decides to leave your city alone <laughs> so you don't go through um, the siege process. <laughs> there, there are no casualties. The other side just moves away, right? They, they just give up. They, they, they move on to, to better things. <laughs> and, and that's what, what I've managed to achieve for, for some of my defense clients as well. So, so these are some examples of decisive victories in the context of, of litigation. And I want you to think about that too in your life, where uh, perhaps you you may be having a dispute with somebody, uh, or, or there, there's a conflict somewhere. Because again, we're talking about scenarios where 
where these games are adversarial, right? So, so I'm talking about scenarios where, but this is not collaborative. This is not where people are working together. These are, these are cases where people are working in opposition. You, you may have some of that going on in your life where you're, you're, you're in opposition to, say, a family member, a neighbor, a friend, a coworker, uh, someone who's harassing you. Uh, not, not everything in life is collaborative. Not everything in life is cooperative. Not, er, sometimes you, you have adversarial situations in life where, where you're in disputes or you're in conflict with other people, uh, other individuals. And how do you handle that situation? So, so think, of, think of these examples I've given you um, and, and see if there is a way where you can ensure a decisive victory for yourself. Use the, the, you know, as little resource as possible, as little energy to um, eliminate the need for conflict or win the conflict uh, decisively as early as possible. StarCraft II uh, really hammers at home in, in, in terms of what I've learned from StarCraft II, which is uh, supported by, by my own experiences and, and uh, the, the, the philosophical writings of, of authors like Samsu. So, so that's decisive victory. So the second thing uh, I've learned from watching StarCraft II is pacing, right? The, the importance of, of pacing. Because sometimes in a dispute, you want to speed things up, and, and sometimes in a dispute, you want to slow things down. So, um, Clem, who, who is uh, the French StarCraft II player uh, from, um, from, from France, uh, a very young and very fast uh, Terran player. He plays the, the Terran, the human race, in StarCraft II. Um, and he's known for something called micro, which is the ability to move his, his units very quickly uh, using, using you know, mouse clicks and, and his keyboard. So he's, he's very dexterous with, with his play style. And, and his pacing is very fast, right? He, he puts a lot of pressure on his opponent. He takes the initiative where, where he's always pressuring, attacking his opponents from, from different angles, always pressing, 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 right? The pacing, like dictating the pace of the conflict, pushing, 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 um, and having the opponent respond to him, right? He's the one trying to dictate the pace and trying to dictate your response. So that's Clem. Maru, who also plays the Terran race, the, the human race in, in this video game, sometimes he takes a step back and he, he plays what is described as a turtle style, right? So he, he tries to go into the late game and he'll, he'll build structures and units uh, in a very defensive way. Um, and he, he tries to slow the game down, right? So, so you come to him. So he, he says, you take the initiative, you come to me. And, and when you come to me, I, I will successfully defend and destroy you. So I'm slowing things down, which is in, in many ways a little bit opposite to Clem, who, who's trying to speed things up. So that's an example of pacing uh, within the context of StarCraft II. That, that I've noticed o over the years. And some players are, are very good at speeding things up and trying to dictate the pace. Other players are saying, hey, you know, come to me. I'm going to be more defensive. I'm going to slow things down. And, and the speeding things up and the slowing, the speeding, let me rephrase that. I, I, I tripped there with my tongue. But the, the speeding uh, up of pace and the slowing down of pace in a conflict is really important. Neither is good or bad, but, but you have to figure out whether speeding things up and dictating the pace is is good, or slowing things down is is of benefit to you. So, from military history, one of the best examples of being quick and speeding things up and um, acting before your opponents can react would probably be one of the best examples. Would probably be 1939, right? The beginning days of the Second World War where the, the German war machine led by Adolf Hitler um, and the Nazis uh, completely overwhelmed neighboring countries like Poland and France. So, so 1939, uh, using a technique known as Blitzkrieg. Most of you should be aware of this. Um, you've learned this in school. Blitzkrieg, lightning warfare. Um, he, uh, Hitler commanded, uh, well, not directly commanded, but uh, you know the, Hitler's Nazi army uh, through the use of panzers, which were tanks, the Luftwaffe, which was the air force, um, you know, paratroopers and, and you know, even infantry. Uh, they, 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 they entered Poland very quickly before the Polish could muster a defense. 
uh, they were capturing towns and going behind enemy lines in a very quick pace. Uh, so much so that the, the Poles were, were caught off guard. And within weeks, uh, Warsaw, what, what was the capital of Poland, was captured. Uh, and all of Poland uh, was captured. Uh, obviously, the Soviet Union uh, historically was actually moving in from, from the other side. So Poland, unfortunately, was split between um, Germany, Nazi Germany, and the Soviet Union. So uh, we're very unfortunate for, for the Poles. If you do ever get to visit uh, Poland, do visit the, um, the uh, Warsaw Uprising uh, Museum. Um, the Warsaw Uprising took place in uh, 1944. It's a, a very, very important museum. I, I would highly recommend it. But, but, but I digress. But that's an example from military history of speeding up the pace, dictating the pace, overwhelming your enemy. Uh, Hitler did the same in France in 1940 uh, with the invasion of France. His uh, use of Blitzkrieg, um, you know, lightning warfare, having fast-paced units outmaneuver uh, the opponent. What was key to his capture of Paris um, and the eventual capitulation of France, which happened again within uh, within a couple months, and it was a huge surprise to the French. I mean, there was um, sort of a slogan or a phrase or maybe a quote that came after, uh, which was that France prepared well, but for the wrong war, because they had concentrated their defenses on the Maginot Line, which was a line of defensive works um, that was uh, used predominantly during the First World War 20 years earlier. Um, but they had not anticipated this type of pace uh, from the Germans, this lightning attack of, of you know, combined arms units of air force and, and panzer tanks and infantry moving behind enemy lines, um, disrupting um, enemy formations capturing cities with, without the opponent being France or, or um, the opponent being France or, or Poland in, in this example, without the, the opponent having the ability to, to properly mobilize and respond because the pace was just so quick. So, so that's an example. And the Blitzkrieg is, is a great military example of, of taking the initiative of speeding up the pace of, of a particular conflict and, and dictating that pace. Uh, now, I'll, I'll provide an example from, from athletics history, from, from sports history, uh, where, where the opposite occurred, uh, where uh, the, the winner in, in this particular adversarial situation uh, wanted to slow down the pace. So I'm going to take you to 1974. Uh, city of Kinshasa in, in Zaire, which is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. But in Kinshasa uh, at the time, there was uh, a sporting event called a Rumbo in the Jungle, <laughs> which was uh, promoted as one of the most important sporting events uh, of the century. It was a boxing match uh, between no other than uh, Muhammad Ali and his rival at the time was George Foreman. Now, Muhammad Ali was, was past his prime at, at the time uh, in 1940s, uh, 19, sorry, 1974. He was past his prime. He was, you know, getting a bit older. He, he wasn't as, uh, as athletically optimal <laughs> as the younger George Foreman. George Foreman was undefeated at the time. He was an absolute monster. His strength, um, his speed, he was... Uh, a very, very difficult uh, opponent to beat. Um, he was he was younger than Ali. Um, he hit harder than Ali, um, and, and I think by by most estimates he was stronger uh, than than Ali. So so he was uh, an opponent that was was just seemingly insurmountable, right? Mo most people at the time when they were placing their bets had Ali as the underdog uh, going into. Uh, Rumbo in the jungle. Uh, the, uh, so Ali had to come up with uh, with a strategy uh, to to beat George Foreman. Otherwise, he was toast. So so in the first round, Ali and George Foreman they, they trade their blows, um, and Ali quickly finds out that that they can't fight George Foreman um, in open combat. Not 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 trading blows. Not punch for punch. George Foreman was was uh, too strong. Right? And, and he was just too big, too strong for Ali to be trading blows, pound for pound. Um, doing this for a couple rounds, he would be 
knocked out and George Foreman, the younger, stronger fighter, would inevitably win. Ali had to use his, his intelligence here to, to somehow outsmart George Foreman. And that's where the control of pacing becomes really important for Muhammad Ali. He decides to slow down the fight. Right? He decides to do something called rope-a-dope. Um, so, so he goes up against the ropes in, 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 in the boxing... Um, is it called a square or the boxing... Um, I don't know what you call that square thing where, where, where they fight. We'll call it, we'll call it the, the square. I mean, there's probably a, a technical... Uh, oops, my camera. Uh, I'm, I'm playing with a gimbal here and, and it's like going all over the place. So I apologize for that. There we, there we go. This gimbal is uh, it's a little bit weird. I'm, I'm using some new technology here. And so I'm not actually holding the camera. It's being held by, uh, by, uh, by a machine uh, that's, uh, that's being controlled by me. So there we go. I think that's, that's a bit better. I'm still playing around with it. Apologies. Um, so the, the boxing, we're going to call it the square. Uh, again, I, I don't know the technical term for it, but um, but he, he he goes on the ropes, and he decides that he will just allow George Foreman to punch him, right? But he's deflecting the shots. He he has his his hands up, and he's deflecting the shots. He's not taking any real damage. And George Foreman just wails at him. He just like slams you know his body and and uses his arms and just just a flurry of punches against Muhammad Ali and Muhammad Ali taunts him Muhammad Ali taunts George Foreman and says faster George you know attack me and, and, and George you know just keeps going and, and what Muhammad Ali is doing is actually slowing down the pace of the fight because he, he's not actually taking any damage for him he's, he's dictating the pace but his pace is slowing things down not speeding things up George Foreman wants to speed things up, right? George Foreman wants to speed things up, wants to, wants to knock Muhammad Ali down, but Muhammad Ali wants to slow things down. You know, he, he wants the fight to happen at his pace. So, so he just lies on the ropes, right? He, he's mainly just static on the ropes, just taking these shots, but not taking any real damage. He's just in a defensive turtle position, leaning against the ropes, this rope-a-dope uh, strategy. And he does this for several rounds, until the eighth round of the fight. And in the eighth round, George Foreman is visibly tired. Uh, he is, uh, you know, breathing heavily. His just, you know, you can see it on his face. He, he's, and, and later on in interviews, he described this as, as the most tired uh, he had ever been, right? He, he's just whatever energy he has left, he's trying to knock down Ali. And then Ali changes the pacing, right? So from, from slow to finally, he takes the initiative, right? Now Ali's on the attack. And because George Foreman has spent all of his energy in six rounds, just you know, spending all of his energy attacking Ali, where, where all, all, all of his blows were deflected, uh, Ali now has the, the advantage. Um, and uh, within minutes, he knocks out uh, George Foreman and, and wins the bout. Very, very famous victory. Um, and, and you can see the changing of pacing uh, in, in this particular victory. Um, so, so that's an example from some sporting history um, and athletic history of, of pace. So what does this mean for you in a conflict? How, how is the control of pacing important? Uh, I'll give some examples from, from my professional life. Um, sometimes you have uh, people, whether they be clients or, or people you, you, you're interacting with um, professionally or personally who are trying to harass you, right? So they're, they're trying to, and sometimes you get lots of emails from them. You get like short, uh, aggravating emails. They're trying to harass you. They're trying to get something from you. Um, and, and they're trying to provoke you into responding, right? So, so in a case like that, you may want to slow down the pace. Right? You may want, want to not respond, or you may want to respond only one of three messages, right? whether it's a text message uh, or an email. You know, sometimes you see this with, uh, um, with fights between uh, ex-partners or, or ex-lovers, where, where one person is, is sending a lot, of, a lot of messages to the other person. Uh, maybe 
the, the winning strategy here is not to engage them pound for pound into you know, every text they send to you, you respond by, by a text. Maybe you want to respond every th three texts you send one or four texts you send one, or maybe you don't want to respond at all. Right? That, that would be slowing. That was, that, that's what I would consider slowing down the pace, dictating the pace, but slowing it down, where, where you're, you're deflecting this, um, this communication that's coming in or, or, or communication that you may perceive as, as being harassing or, or provoking. So that, that could be your, your key to victory in a scenario like that. Uh, conversely, um, for example, if... If someone owes you money, or, or you're trying to chase uh, an invoice or, or a debt, you may want to you may want to add that pressure. You may want to speed things up. You may need to bother people three times, four times a day to get them to respond to you, right? So conversely, if you need that response, if you're chasing a tenant who's not paying you, if you're chasing a client who's not paying you, um, you you may need to bother them. You need you may need to pester them with phone calls. You may need to, to pester them with emails and text messaging. Uh, and, and you may need to be annoying. You may need to s speed up the pace and, and dictate that pace of uh, of the communication. So, so these are, and there could be many other examples in in life where where you're in a conflict situation with another person, uh, and at times speeding up the pace of communication, the frequency of of the text messages and the emails and and the phone calls is is better for you, and maybe slowing things down. In, in, in other cases, may be better for you. So, so these are all strategies that apply to everyday conflicts, they apply to military conflicts, they apply to sporting conflicts, um, and of course also to StarCraft too. So, so these are examples that, that I think are, are universal. Uh, and once you, you know, see these examples in, in one arena uh, of life, um, you, you see how they are very analogous in other arenas of life as well and you see how they can equally apply in other games in life okay so the next thing uh, i'm going to talk about is the power of counterattacks, and this is where we have the old phrase sometimes the best defense is a good attack in starcraft 2 you often see uh, very uh, strong counterattacks where if one person's base is being attacked uh, by a group of units uh, they they may attack your base in exchange right so there's a group of units called zerglings uh, which um, are from the zerg uh, race so the space bugs and a very common strategy uh, used by zerg players is something called a zergling run by or a ling run by which is while their base is being attacked, they'll send a group of, of cheap uh, units uh, to harass your base um, and assault your your workers and and your base. So that, that's that's often what happens in the game. So that's a, a counterattack, right? So at, at the highest level of StarCraft II, you, you see people using counterattacks as a way to set their opponents off balance um, and to to respond to to an attack that's happening so sometimes when, when you're being attacked obviously um, you, you have to bring some of your units home in order to defend that's the general strategy um, and this applies uh, I, I think both in terms of military doctrine and, and certainly applies to uh, conflicts that you have with other people as well uh, so in terms of military doctrine, the best example that I can give you, considering that this is August 2024, is a very contemporary example. It is Ukraine's invasion of Russia. So, so as most of you know, in February 2022, Russia uh, invaded Ukraine. Now, not for the first time. Uh, there was some annexing of territory that happened in 2014, the annexing of Crimea and parts of Luhansk on Donetsk. Uh, after the Euromaidan protests, uh, Russia uh, threw uh, what some commentators called little green men, uh, you know, maybe not formal uh, Russian army units, but, um, you know, elements uh, of, of the Russian government. Um, they, they had annexed uh, Crimea, Luhansk, and parts of Donetsk. And of course, the full-scale war started in 
February 2022, uh, when uh, the, the full Russian army uh, went into Ukraine, attempted to conquer all of Ukraine, failed to do so, at least as of right now, uh, as of August 2024. The war is still ongoing, so we, we don't know the outcome of the war yet. But um, as of August 2024, uh, the Russians have made some gains, uh, mostly in, in the south and in the east, um, they've been driven out of Kiev. They were never able to conquer uh, Kiev. Uh, and, and the war is, is ongoing. And, and for the last several months, it was at uh, a standstill. Right? There was, um, you know, a, a lot of attrition that, 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 that's been occurring in the war, uh, but, but not a significant amount of territorial gains so so the, the the battle lines have become more or less frozen more or less right some territorial gains here and there uh, but slow attritional territorial gains uh, from both sides until very suddenly in the summer of 2024 uh, while the Russians were putting pressure in, in the south um, east uh, of Ukraine the Ukrainians uh, launched a surprise counterattack against the Kursk region uh, in Russia. They actually invaded. So currently, as I'm filming this video, there are Ukrainian forces in the Kursk region uh, of Russia. Um, and the strategic goal, uh, at least the, the assumed strategic goal of, of this counterattack against the Russians, uh, number one, to uh, allow... Uh, the Ukrainians some breathing room so that the Russians will have to divert some of their forces in the east and south uh, up to the Kursk area in the, in, in the north so that some of their units will have to be diverted to, to relieve some of Ukraine's own fighting units in the east and south. Um, number two as a morale booster for for a Ukrainian army that uh, you know by many accounts has been somewhat been demoralized after two years of war with little rest with a lot of the best units uh, and, and soldiers dying. Um, so, so there's certainly a morale booster uh, for, for uh, you know, uh, an army that's been mostly on the defensive uh, for the strategic reasons uh, of having the Kursk region as potentially a bargaining chip. If uh, in the future there's some talk of uh, exchange of territory, perhaps they, they being the Ukrainians could uh, reclaim some some parts of their territory that they lost to the Russians in exchange for giving back the Kursk area uh, as, as a territorial swap. Um, also, uh, the fourth reason as a buffer zone to, to create some space so that the, the Russians will have a harder time launching attacks um, against the city of Kharkiv, uh, especially uh, using glide bombs and, and bombers. So. So there's been some strategic benefit in, in taking over the Kursk area to prevent uh, attacks being launched from that area against Kharkiv and certain Ukrainian cities. So there, there's a number of reasons why the counterattack was, was launched. Uh, and we, we don't know the full uh, extent uh, of, as to whether the counterattack will ultimately be successful. We're still in the middle of, of this counterattack, the Ukrainians, uh, as of today, are, are still there in Kursk. They, they haven't moved out, and the Russians have not been able to dislodge them. Um, so, again, we, we don't know the, the full implications because it's still a current event that's unfolding. But we do know that this was a counterattack, right? We do know that this was considered by, by Ukraine to be of strategic importance, uh, and it, it certainly took the Russians by surprise. Of, and this is an example, a contemporary example of, of what counterattacks look like, right? To, to unbalance the opponent, uh, to uh, boost morale, to force the opponent to shift resources, to perhaps uh, use captured territory as a bargaining chip for future exchange of, uh, of uh, you know, territory should there be a ceasefire and a peace treaty. Uh, so all of this is, is being uh, demonstrated right now uh, by way of the Ukrainian counterattack. So that's, it's happening right now, right? So that you can see military doctrine being applied, uh, in, you know, in real time. So, so the value of counterattacks is not just the theoretical uh, thing that you see in StarCraft II and, and in games, but, but you see that uh, in, in, in real life. If I were to apply the concept of uh, counterattacks to law and to litigation, but the best example is something called a counterclaim, right? which is where someone sues you 
and then you threaten to sue them <laughs> in exchange. Um, so I'll give you an example of where this was actually really effective. In, in, in a human rights case, I represented a client where we filed a human rights claim against the employer. So just so you know, the reason I'm, I'm always mentioning employers and employees is because I, I predominantly practice in workplace law. So I predominantly um, deal with workplace disputes as, as my practice area. So, so we launched a, a human rights complaint uh, against the employer. And then the employer hired very uh, aggressive uh, lawyers who then, in response, sued the employee. <laughs> So they, they counterclaimed in Superior Court, which was a, a different forum than the Human Rights Tribunal, but, but they counterclaimed against my client, the employee, uh, and for, for stupid and frivolous reasons, right? It was just strategic. There was no real um, substance to the counterclaim uh, beyond intimidating uh, my, my client and, and forcing my client to think twice before pursuing uh, litigation further. And the net result is uh, at mediation, my client ended up with nothing. My client was so intimidated by, by this counterclaim that he gave up his whole human rights uh, case in exchange for the employer giving up the counterclaim. So it was a wash for everyone, right? Was the employer right in, in, in these circumstances? Absolutely not. They, I mean, they had nothing on the guy. They had absolutely nothing on the guy. And the human rights claim was, and the human rights application was, was much stronger than this frivolous counterclaim, but it, it served the psychological effect of intimidating um, my, my client. And, and my client was just so intimidated and so scared of, of the potential of having to pay money to the employer because the counterclaim was for a large amount of money. So, so psychologically, it was very intimidating for him that, that he gave up a very legitimate uh, human rights claim uh, for, for discrimination. So unfortunately for, for the client, that was the client's choice. Nothing I could do about it. Uh, but reflecting on, on this scenario, the counterclaim was a brilliant strategic choice by the other lawyer, right? This very aggressive counterclaim was, was in fact uh, very effective <laughs> in that it, it resulted in my client giving up very easily um, and not pushing forward on a human rights application that otherwise had a lot of merit. So that's where counterclaims can, can actually be quite effective. So, so you may want to think about that in, in your next conflict with whoever. I'm not encouraging you to have conflict, but, but if you do have a conflict with whoever you may have a conflict with, sometimes a best, uh, the best defense is, is a good offense, right? Uh, the best defense is a good attack. So if you're having a dispute with, with someone, maybe the best way to resolve the dispute really is to threaten them uh, in, in some way. Now, I'm not encouraging you to, to go cavalier on this and to, to make up, um, you know, uh, false allegations or, or, or do anything that's, that's unsavory or unethical. But, but in, in the course of, of disputes, uh, where if you're playing by the same rules at least, then some type of attack, a counter allegation, a counter claim uh, could, could actually be the solution to the problems that, that you have, right? If you're gonna attack me, I'm going to attack you. If you have dirt on me, I have some dirt on you. If you're gonna make life difficult for me, well, I can also make life difficult for you, so you better watch out and you better think twice um, before uh, pursuing what you're about to pursue. So that's a strategy that, that you can think about in, in your own life as well. So the last thing I've learned from StarCraft II is the power of surprise and and doing the the unexpected um, so Cyril who, who is a, a Zerg player um, traditionally he's known for building up a very strong economy uh, in, in the game of Starcraft 2 um, not making mistakes and, and just doing more and better than his opponents but recently he, he's really solidified his grasp as one of the best StarCraft II players, at least at the competitive level, because of his ability also to surprise his opponents, to do things that are unexpected. So not only is he really good at macro, which is you know building up resources and building up large armies, but also he's begun to uh, surprise his opponents. Uh, in StarCraft II, the, the term is called cheesing, which is to do something a little bit cheesy, but, but to surprise opponents to catch them off guard. Uh, Dark, who is... Um, Another Zerg player from South Korea. He's very good at at surprises and and sometimes doing things that are unexpected, right? So he's 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 known to to 
do stuff like that. So there are certain StarCraft II players who are well known to uh, do the unexpected. Sun Tzu, going back to Sun Tzu, our, our military uh, genius uh, from the Art of War, he said that all war is deception. All war is deception. I'm paraphrasing, but, but I think he said, you know, all war is deception or all deception is, is part of all war or, or something like that. You, you get the idea, but all war is is deception. It, it's, it's a key component. Doing the unexpected and surprising your opponents is a, a, a key element of, of any conflict. If we were to go back uh, into the annals of military history, then uh, there's no better example than uh, of surprise and doing the unexpected than the Second Punic Wars. So the Second Punic Wars were fought between uh, the Romans and the Carthaginians. So most people know about the Romans, right? The, the Romans were, were centered around the city of Rome. They, they, they were around for, you know, a thousand years. <laughs> they were a very powerful, um, ancient group of people that had a republic and then eventually an empire. I think most people know about the ancient Romans. I don't have to educate you on that. Um, and, and then the Carthaginians, they were another group of people who unfortunately uh, eventually were wiped out. But uh, they had uh, the city of Carthage, uh, which is close to modern-day Tunis. Um, in, in, the, in what was modern-day Tunisia. Uh, the Carthaginians, um, they, or the city of Carthage, originally was a Phoenician colony. So the Phoenicia, uh, or f that, that area was, was now in modern-day Lebanon. So they had a colony in, in North Africa, which became the Carthaginians. Um, so I, I don't want to confuse you with too much history here, but, but they, they were another very, very powerful group of, of ancient people who existed alongside the Romans at one point. And they had uh, three wars, three wars called the Punic Wars for dominance of the Mediterranean and for dominance of the entire uh, Western world to an extent. I actually have a video uh, about this, a separate video about what would have happened if Carthage had defeated Rome. So if you want to check out my other video, it's, it's in my channel. But, but you had this sort of clash of titans between these two very strong ancient civilizations. And during the Second Punic War, so the second of this series of, uh, of three wars, the, the Carthaginians under the general Hannibal, right? So, so you may have heard of this name, Hannibal. They, they had a general named Hannibal who probably um, succeeded in enacting one of the biggest military surprises in, in ancient history and all of military history, which is instead of attacking the Romans uh, directly through, say, a, a Mediterranean uh, attack uh, up the Italian peninsula, which was well guarded, and, and the Romans certainly were expecting the Carthaginians to attack along those routes, he decided to uh, traverse the Alps. He, he decided to go across the Alps in a roundabout way across the Alps, to attack the Romans uh, from the north and, and, and moving his way down. He also took with him war elephants, right? So I'm sure you may have seen this image of elephants crossing the Alps and, and Hannibal riding one of these war elephants. So, so he had sort of two surprises for the Romans in the Second Punic Wars. He, he crossed the Alps, so, which was a surprise, right? Doing the unexpected. The Romans would have never suspected for, for Hannibal to take the long route across the mountains to attack them. So their defenses certainly were not set up um, in the north part of the country to defend against uh, Hannibal crossing the Alps. And certainly they were not prepared for war elephants. <laughs> uh, so, no. Ultimately, the unfortunate uh, piece to the story is despite a number of significant victories by Hannibal, including at, at the battlefield of Cannae, um, uh, the, the Carthaginians eventually lose the Second Punic War. And in the Third Punic War, uh, their city and their civilization is entirely obliterated by the Romans. So, so there's a, sort of a sad ending for the Carthaginians. Uh, but that being said, um, the power of doing the unexpected still, it, it's a... It's, um, in, in this particular moment where, where Hannibal crosses the Alps and he brings in the war elephants, he is able to, um, victory after victory, uh, defeat the Romans um, and, and catch them completely off guard. So, so at least in the beginning of, of the Second Punic War, um, Hannibal is, is able to uh, 
uh, secure a number of very important military victories. So the power of surprise is, is very well demonstrated by Hannibal. Uh, another example, maybe where the stakes are a little bit lower, I, 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 and I always like this example, um, 1972. Um, it's in the middle of the Cold War, and there's a chess match <laughs> that happens in Reykjavik, Iceland. Uh, on one side is Boris Spassky, right, representing the Soviet Union, uh, a, a very strong Soviet chess player, and facing him is um, the American Bobby Fischer, right, who, who at the time uh, of this competition in 1972 had, had never defeated Boris Spassky. Um, so, so they they match off in, in you know the chess match of the century, 1972 Reykjavik, Iceland. Um, so in, in the first, um, and, and they're supposed to play up to 24 matches, uh, with the first person winning at least uh, 12 or 12 and a half, uh, you get a half point if you draw. Um, the first person winning 12 and a half or, or, or 12 wins the, the tournament. Uh, so in, in the first game between Spassky and Bobby Fischer, uh, Bobby makes... Uh, at, you know, in the beginning, you know, things things are good. They're they're matching each other, and Bobby makes uh, what would be considered a critical mistake, uh, a mistake that that would be considered unlike uh, you know a grandmaster, unbecoming of a grandmaster. You know, something that unexpectedly, um, and he he ends up trapping his bishop behind a series of pawns. Um, and, and he eventually has to lose or sacrifice the bishop and, and, and just resigns, right? So it's a bit of an amateur move by, by Bobby Fischer. So he loses the first uh, match. And then, then he, Bobby Fischer starts to complain about the cameras and the noise from the cameras in, inside the, the tournament hall. He gets a little bit paranoid about, um, <laughs> about the cameras and, and being watched. Um, and in the second game, this is, this is where the unexpected comes in. In the second game, Bobby Fischer doesn't show up, right? He just doesn't show up at all to the second game. Uh, Boris Spassky just wins by default. Bobby Fischer doesn't show up. Now, whether he did this intentionally or unintentionally, this was certainly unexpected. Now, there, there's some de historic debate as to whether this was an intentional strategy or perhaps an unintentional uh, <laughs> thing. I don't know. Who knows why he didn't show up? But, but it was unexpected he doesn't show up and, and this actually had a really interesting result of him not showing up and being down to nothing so so it had several effects one it, it irritated Boris Spassky significantly even after the the, the the entire match was over Boris Spassky said in an interview that he was very irritated by Bobby not not showing up uh, secondly it made Boris Spassky highly underestimate Bobby Fischer uh, because you know he was up to nothing at this point. He's like, who is this little kid? He's not. He's not even showing up. Um, and number three, uh, Boris Spassky started to make certain concessions to Bobby Fischer, and, and Bobby said, you know, on, on the next round, game three, I, I want to play in a back room, right, without the cameras. So I want to play in, in an environment that's a bit more comfortable for me. And Boris Spassky, you know, makes this makes this concession, right? And, and this is all coming from from the second game where he doesn't show up. So, in hindsight, this was actually really brilliant. Because then the dynamics change, right? And, and, and psychologically, something happens in game three where Bobby Fischer is now making moves that, that he's, never, he's never played before, right? He's, he's being creative. He, he's trying openers and, and, and different types of moves that, that, that Boris has never seen, right? And in game three, he, he wins. Right? There's a fire in his eye, and he, he's, he's, he's doing things the world has never seen before. Uh, and and then, you know, wins, wins against Boris Spassky, and he's never done this before. Right? A after surprisingly dropping 2-0 to Boris Spassky. Um, and in the fourth game, they tie, and, and, and so on and so forth. In the sixth game, he, 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 he beats Spassky, uh, and the audience applauds Bobby Fischer and, and Boris Spassky even gets up and applauds Bobby Fischer in, in the sixth game of, of this tournament. The, the game is called the Applause Game, 
where, where he's applauded. And, and part of this was, was actually the inspiration for Queen's Gambit, uh, which was, you can see it on, on Netflix, about a fictional a chess player. But the, the applause by, by the Soviet player uh, of the American player is actually inspired by, by the 1972 Game 6 between Spassky and, and Bobby Fischer. Uh, so eventually Bobby Fischer wins uh, 12 and a half to eight and a half um, in, in this tournament. Uh, but, but he did something really unexpected. Well, at least to Boris, it was really unexpected of, of not showing up. So, so I, I like that story uh, because, you know, it, it's... Now, obviously, this is an example where we're not too sure if he intentionally chose to not show up as, as a strategy or if he just just didn't show up. And, and as a result, it became a strategy. We're, we're not too sure what the intention was. You know, I, I, I can't ask Bobby Fischer. He's passed away and, 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 you know, we can't get into his head. But the net result of, of this not showing up strategically was a master stroke. You know, in, in hindsight, um, this 2 nothing drop um, and this no-show on game two completely somehow changed the dynamic and eventually resulted in, in Bobby uh, doing things that Boris did not expect. Um, and, and he wins this tournament. Uh, how does the element of surprise apply to real life? Uh, well, in, in, in conflicts that you may have with whoever you may be having conflicts with, uh, you may want to use the element of surprise to your advantage and, and to do something that is unexpected as a way to, to gain the advantage of, in, in a conflict. I'll give you one example from my professional life, uh, which is that I represented and this is all public record, so I, I, I'm, I'm okay with sharing this. It's not confidential. I represented a client um, against a fairly large bank, and, and we claimed that the client was mistreated, uh, and, and we claimed something called constructive dismissal, which is that uh, they should provide my client with a severance package, the sum of money. So this very large bank, um, they, they refused to do so. They said, we're, we're not going to give you any money. Um, so they expected us just to, to go away. But part of the reason why we were claiming constructive dismissal was because the client was not paid his vacation pay um, and, and was not paid holiday pay in contravention of some of the legislation. So you know, the, the bank was expecting, hey, look, <laughs> these, we're not going to give them money. We're going to intimidate them. We're, we're just going to be bullies and... You know we're richer than you, so so eventually you're just going to go away. Don't bother us. So so I decided. Well, look, if if my client is owed vacation pay and holiday pay, well, there are probably other people at the bank who are also owed vacation pay and holiday pay. So so I brought a 25 million dollar class action <laughs> against this bank, um, and my client turned from a plaintiff into a representative plaintiff, representing 40,000 other employees of this particular bank. Now they did not expect that. <laughs> I can tell you. So so do the unexpected. This particular class action is now ongoing um, it's, it's all public record you can research it yourself if you if you want um, it, it hasn't resolved yet it's it's an ongoing process but we, we intend to to resolve this matter uh, in, in, the, the, in the upcoming months and years so that's personally I, I think uh, a very good example from my professional life where I did something at least unexpected not not unexpected from my standpoint but certainly I would say it was unexpected from the perspective of the bank so that is uh, how I would conclude this particular topic on the power of doing the unexpected so uh, recapping you know, I, I've been watching this this computer game for for a decade and a half, StarCraft II, um, and, and I've learned so much just by watching military strategy unfold before my eyes. Um, military strategy, albeit simulated between competitive players, but these strategies they apply to to other aspects of of life. They apply to historic examples where the same strategies are are, are being used. Um, they apply to contemporary examples, and not only within the military context, uh, but also within an athletic context and within a, a litigation context. And really, I think any context where there is a, an adversarial relationship, where, where it's a zero-sum game, where you are in conflict with somebody else, where there's a dispute, um, and one of you, you know, one of you may win, one of you may lose, right? That, that's that's what all of these scenarios have in common. War is often an adversarial um, you know, game, uh, athletics, uh, you know, boxing, 
um, and and in the sporting competitions. Um, these are adversarial games. StarCraft II and games like StarCraft II, strategy games and other kinds, types of games where you have a winner and a loser, uh, where you have competitive play, that's an adversarial game. Uh, litigation, an adversarial game. Um, and that's, that's, that's where I want you to think about where in life uh, are, are the adversarial games, where in life are perhaps the collaborative games, right? Because most games... Uh, or at least many games are not adversarial. Many games in life are collaborative, where, where you're actually trying to work with other people for, for, for the common good and, and for the benefit of everyone, right? Those games are probably a bit more friendly um, and they're not as, as toxic. And, and most people, I think, like collaborative games more. But sometimes adversarial games in life are, are forced upon you, right? You have no choice. Uh, if someone's harassing you, you have no choice that, that someone's harassing you. If someone sues you, uh, you have no choice. You, you have you know, you're, you have no choice as to whether they're suing you. You're being sued, right? If you're being stalked by, by an ex-lover, uh, being, uh, you know, berated by, by a family member, if you're having conflict with, with your neighbor, sometimes, sometimes you, you, you don't have choice in, in these conflicts. These conflicts find you and, and you have no choice. And, and how do you defeat your opponents uh, in these scenarios where, where you have a workplace conflict um, you know, family conflict, a friendship conflict, a, fr uh, a conflict with a, a stranger, a conflict with an authority figure. You know, these, these are conflicts that we, we have in daily life. Um, and the strategies that, that we see in computer games, in military history, in sports, they apply to, to the everyday conflicts that we have uh, as individuals within the society. Um, so, so be a strategist, right? Don't just blindly fight a battle without thinking. Think about the strategies uh, we talked about today. Think about your own strategies. Um, and I hope that you win your next conflict. Until next time, this is Randy I. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And I will see all of you in the next video.